Welcome to our December 7th round table. It is hard to believe that this is the last round table of 2020. And I will turn it over to George for our opening, please. So the, our uh, prayer for this evening is the peace light prayer. Um, so let's start. May the kindly spirit of Christmas spread its radiance far and wide. So all the world may feel the glow of this holy Christmas tide. So many, so may this light of peace today that has traveled many miles bring joy and hope to many and fill each face with smiles. So may every heart and home continue through the year to feel the warmth and wonder of this season of good cheer. May it bring us closer to God and to each other. Amen. Amen. Thank you, George. Um... I am telling it that I want to share my screen and it's giving me this other funny thing. Okay, here we go. Okay. Our point of the scout law for this month is courteous. Our quote comes from Thomas Fuller, all doors open to courtesy. So, take care of that. Um, Moving into announcements, Greg and Joshua, council updates. All right. There we go. Oh, so the the trading post continues to have the same hours of Monday, uh, eleven thirty to seven p.m. Wednesday and Friday, nine to four. And uh, this past Saturday, we were open during popcorn sales. Uh, we had a number of visitors come in and turn in charter renewals. So we're going to uh, do that again on the 19th with hours from 9.30 uh, to 1 p.m. for uh, store purchases and charter turn in. Uh, also, if anybody orders anything online and wants to pick it up at the store from the Moses Trading Post, uh, it can be there as well. Um, continue to to ship out a number of advancements and other items from the store also. So I'm not gonna read all of this, but on our website, if you go to uh, offices and, and stores, hours, uh, there's information there about sending in your advancement reports and just sharing specifically what you need, other items that you want to have ready and the Trading Post staff will help you uh, pull that together for you to either pick up or to sh ship it out to you uh, after contacting you for payment. Uh, and a lot of questions about who do I contact now with uh, things changing. Uh, the office is starting to settle into a groove uh, now for what we're doing. So on our main page, you can click on the staff contacts and it takes you to a page that has this type of information on it. So the most common um, phone calls we're getting right now is uh, about merit badge counselor list, which is great. And we just discovered that on Scout Book, uh, if you log in the scout book, um, now that we know we have to clear our cache and our cookies and all that type of stuff to get to the new server, uh, click on your dashboard. And if you are a troop leader, you should have an MB counselor list option. And you can put in your zip code and uh, tell it five miles, 10 miles, 20 miles, and it'll come up with all the registered merit badge counselors that are available for you. So, and that is synchronized every single night. So that's the best way to do that. The other calls are about being locked out of Scoutbook or myscouting.com. Uh, and I can help with most of those needs at this point in time, uh, or bounce that up to the National Help Desk. And then right now, rechartering arts, uh, probably the best contact for questions about rechartering. And um, last time I talked a little bit about unit money earning applications. So a little highlight on that. Uh, you can find this form. It's a very easy form. If your unit's doing a fundraiser, uh, it should come into the council. It's a very quick process. I usually turn it around within two minutes of seeing the form uh, so that your fundraiser is approved and covered by insurance. And uh, if anybody has questions about it, we can verify it's happening. Here are all the units that have approved fundraisers for the year. That is, those are all of the units that have submitted fundraising uh, applications for the year. Uh, every single one of them approved and turned back to them within a day. So uh, 
If you're doing a fundraiser, easy process, send it on in. We're happy to help you with that. Uh, thank you to so many great things happening despite the challenges. I won't read them all there, but uh, it's really continued to, to be great efforts to make sure there's some programming available and uh, highlight our Honoring Our Heroes event, a uh, successful event online with a number of heroes recognized and uh, approximately $80,000 fundraised in that one night. So thank you to everyone that helped make that possible. Uh, continuing our Nova Nights uh, being run out of the Appalachian Trail. Uh, this Saturday is the, is the third uh, session uh, and those registrations are still available, $10 a night. And if you buy an entire pack, uh, it's $20 instead for sessions four through six and seven through nine. Looking to get involved. There's a work day this weekend up at Moses. You can see the projects involved there. Um, if you are a chainsaw trained person, they're especially looking for some help this weekend. And uh, we have our next coordinated committee meeting. Anybody can participate in those. Uh, just sign on in the night of and come join us in uh, working together to programming. Uh, looking forward. A lot of questions about what will happen in January. The districts are, are certainly wanting to do some program, but running into a lot of challenges with the, the COVID upticks and, and trying to find places to do programming. So just be on the lookout for those. Um, they're under consideration uh, for locations and Moses is a backup um, as, as well. And WO will be back in January. Looking even forward past that, um, some items in the spring. Somebody's gonna talk about summer camp as well, coming up soon. And uh, our trading post is live. Uh, we've got lots of options on there. It's a great way to be able to support the council at this time, looking for holiday gifts. Uh, some of the, the Moses engraved knives have been added there, some of the other tools, some fun stocking stuffers. Somebody suggested, I think it was Art Lobdell the other day, uh, even some of the old t-shirts could make a great 50 cent wrapping paper uh, for some of your items. So uh, free shipping for anything over 75 or again, uh, select store pickup and there's no shipping. You can get it right at the store during the office uh, store hours or on the 19th. And uh, with that, I'll just say, Happy holidays, everybody, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Joshua, do you have information from our council commissioner? So uh, thank you, Ellie, and thank you, everybody. I'm just going to uh, keep it very brief. This past Saturday, uh, December 5th, was International Volunteer Day. And so in the spirit of International Volunteer Day, I would just like to say thank you to all of you. You are the volunteers who keep scouting going within the Western Massachusetts Council. Without all of you, without your involvement, we would not have, uh, we would not have a council, we would not have scouting and our lives, I, I, I would have so much free time. I don't know what I would do with myself if I wasn't doing something that has to do with scouting. So thank you for keeping me busy, I guess. Um, and thank you for keeping our scouts and, and, and everybody else busy. And we're in December. It is time to kind of take the opportunity to look back on things, take a deep breath, maybe take a, a few minutes for yourself, and then look to the new year. So again, thank you very much and keep up the good work. Thank you, Joshua. Um, our assistant council commissioner for training for commissioners, uh, Peter, the dean of the College of Commissioner Science, please. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just would like to uh, tell you that, you know, your unit commissioners and other commissioners are always asking you to go out and be trained for your position and to do as much as you can to learn about programming and the whole bit. Well, commissioners do that too. Commissioners want to keep up with the latest techniques, the latest ideas, um, the latest info. And this past weekend at our 38th annual College of Commissioner Science, we had 19 commissioners from our council 
uh, participate along with several others. We were about 85 total. And uh, I would like to just let you know some of the interesting things that, uh, well, I just want you to know that John Benjamin, Mary Benjamin, Lars Brown, Joe Case, Peter Isaac, myself, David O'Leary, Fritz Schmidt, Matt Tassinari, Bradley Tatro, Doug Tatro, Bob Walsh, and Greg Williams were all there participating. Of special note, for the first time, Justin Butler and George Adams not only showed up, but they earned their bachelor's degree in commissioner science. So congratulations to those two guys, as well as but Rob Lusty, and I wish he could make it tonight. Rob Lusty and Ellie um, earned their master degree in round table commissioner science. This may be the last time that that's offered, but let's hear it. And of special note, would be, uh, and you didn't know this yet, but Josh Hall and Cheryl Isaac um, reached the level of advanced training certificate for uh, Commissioner Science. So congratulations to everybody who attended, everybody who learned something new, and many of the people who are here tonight our commissioners, they were also participants in terms of teaching classes or backing up someone with a class. And uh, if I didn't say a very, 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 very special thank you to Greg Williams uh, for doing the electronic side. Uh, oh, I will just leave it at that. We could never have done it without him. And we all know that was a really big job and he pulled through for us. So on behalf of the College of Commissioner Science, thanks very much commissioners and leaders know that your commissioners care and wanna do a better job every time we see you. You can count on us because we are there to help others at all times. That's all. Hey, thank you. Um, a district, are there any district announcements from MetaComet? Yeah, it was, I missed the meeting last week, but um, the only item that I know of right now is we are working on a plan for a Klondike Derby in, in uh, February. So stay tuned. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, any district announcements from Appalachian Trail? Yes, I have two. Um, we are having a fire sat chat this Thursday, um, December 10th from seven o'clock. Um, Hunter just literally just sent out the email to everybody for that and Monday, December 14th, we have the district committee meeting starting at seven as well. Okay, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, from General Knox, our district committee meeting and our commissioner meeting are this Wednesday, the 9th. Um, the commissioner meeting is at six o'clock and then the district committee meeting will start at seven. Fritz, would you like to speak to charter renewal. I know we have some announcements from within General Knox. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah, I would just like to say a couple of things. Typically in General Knox, this would be charter turn-in night. So uh, the expectation would have been that everybody had finished their paperwork and were ready to turn in. And we are at our typical point on charter turn-in night. Only about one third of our units have uh, reached the submit stage. Uh, I don't know if they've gone beyond that, but they've submitted their paperwork electronically and uh, should have printed out and be chasing down signatures and getting payment ready. Uh, another third are working online 
and uh, another third have not yet begun. Um, there is a time limit. Um, so those of you who have not yet begun, I see a few of those faces here, please uh, open up that um, online process and get started and find out where your problems really are. It's not with being shy about using the system. It pretty much works the way that it, it used to. If you have misplaced your unit ID number, let me know. Uh, and uh, I will be happy to send it to you so that uh, you can try to get started. Related to rechartering, um, I would like to say uh, as well that we would like to receive from every unit a Journey to Excellence scorecard. This is a self-evaluation tool uh, where you can uh, take a look at your unit and the things that you've done this past uh, year and um, score yourself on how well you think you've done in a variety of areas and uh, turn that in so we know what you think about yourselves and, and uh, um, can provide any assistance if, if you want that. Uh, finally, um, and maybe this is why some of you have not started the online process yet, if you have leaders who are not youth protection trained, they will not be rechartered. The process is held up indefinitely until those people get certified in youth protection training. So I urge all of you, and we're in a better spot than we were last time. I think last time I spoke to you, I said uh, about a third of our district membership was not certified, was no longer certified. And some of those um, um, people uh, who, who, who failed to recertify go back to February of 2020. Uh, and those numbers just kept going up as we went through the year. Numerous reminders were sent out to people. So uh, I think everybody who has not recertified in, in uh, youth protection training knows by now who they are uh, because I've told them a couple of times. Um, so please get that taken care of. You cannot recharge it without that. And if you're not youth protection certified, you shouldn't be interacting with the kids. That's a violation of BSA policy. So please get that done uh, and then begin that recharter process and uh, get your work done. We're now down to 25%. So some of you have been taking care of that. Last time, every unit in our district had a number of people who had not recertified. Uh, and I, I did see that there was some improvement in that. Um, there are uh, units where everybody has recertified and that, that's a good thing. Thank you very much for being conscientious about that. And uh, please follow through with the rest of your membership. Thank you for it. Um, Art, do you have anything you need to share with a popcorn update? At this point in time, all of the popcorn orders have been distributed. There still is popcorn available for retail sale at the office. Um, it's not as um, piled up as we thought it might have been. And yet at the same time, there still is quite a quantity. It is marked down. Most things are somewhere between um, two thirds and 50%. Um, so if you do need um, some popcorn, it still does make great holiday gifts. Um, have all of the products available. Um, so come on in and get those. Thank you. And certainly also want to call out the units that did participate and thank them for their service in this year's sale. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Bob Walls. You would like to speak to us about camp. I would. Let me share my screen. Can you see this slide? No. I think your video is muted. Yeah, I don't have my uh, my video equipment moved back from the council to the College of Commissioner Science back to the online kindergarten station this morning. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Hang on one sec. Let me see if I can bring it up this way. Can you see that? We can't see anything, Bob. We can't even see you. <laughs> Greg, do you have my slide that I emailed you? Are you still there? Greg Williams. He's working on it. 
pulling it up for you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so while he's doing that, um, <clears throat> As the, whoop. there we go. Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so as the camp director, um, I asked Ellie for a couple of minutes to, to uh, talk to the representatives on the round table to talk about summer camp 2021. Um, obviously factors that we're all well aware of prevented us from having summer camp uh, in 2020, but we are moving ahead with plans for next summer. Now, obviously plan A is to hold camp at Moses Scout Reservation, and that's our primary concentration, but plan B is gonna to be to try and understand, can we do some kind of virtual offering? but we are moving ahead with plans as if the world is gonna turn in our favor and we're gonna be able to hold resident camp for both Scouts BSA and Cub Scouts at camp itself. Right now the current plan, and if you go to the council website on camping and summer camp, you can see the schedule. Uh, it's the month of July right now, the first three weeks are for Scout BSA and the fourth week is for uh, Cub Scouts. If you take a look at this, there's four things I want to talk about. The first one talks about the attendance at camp, and you can see Scouts BSA and Cub resident attendance over the last three years. So on the Scouts BSA side, you can see positive growth. Now, one thing to consider, for example, in 2019, that 544 looks great, but 144 of those are from scouts outside our council. So from the Western Mass Council, there were 400, but every scout we see counts. So that's a positive trend that you can see. On the Cub resident side, we have some challenges. Now in 2019, we had the, the issue with, uh, with Gramby and the day camps and all that type of thing, but you can see the trend from 128 to 103 to 64. So that that slope is going in the wrong direction. So obviously we're all well aware of this COVID environment we live in. We're also well aware of the lawsuit. Um, and I'm so glad I'm tired. I was so tired of watching all those commercials. I'm glad that is all over, uh, but there's still a big question mark. Nationally, they, they expect a 50% loss in membership coming into this year. There's many, many, many factors, but um, you know, the lawsuit and the COVID and declining available youth, lots of reasons why uh, that number is going down. There's an initiative that some of you may be aware of called the Churchill Plan. And what it is, is the National BSA's plan um, when we come out of this. They're going to be, they're abandoning regions and areas, and they're going to uh, what they had many years ago, service territories. Turns out we're going to be in territory 11, which is most of New England. But the plan is to, the goal is to better serve and support local councils. So one of the things that they're doing is they're setting up council performance standards to ensure the highest quality level at all the councils in, in the country. And one piece of that is to ensure financial stability. Some councils are strong, some councils aren't so strong. So they'll certainly be looking at council consolidations. Another thing they're taking a look at is they're analyzing all the camps and they're taking a look at what your attendance trends are over the last couple of years and you have have you been profitable now the camps are meant to be a key uh, money driver that goes back to the council we're in a good position in that area and you can see the, the numbers support that but again not all camps and not all councils are in that position so for us at moses scout reservation 
one of the things we're doing, and we're having our first meeting on Wednesday, we're putting together a team to review the whole camp program. And that's for Scouts, BSA, as well as Cub Scouts. And right now that this team is going to uh, initially including the directors. So the program area directors, plus the council program director, Andrew, myself, John Willemaine, Greg, etc. And we're also including uh, volunteers who, whose units come to our camp, who go to other camps. And the other piece of that is surprisingly, and honestly, sadly, there's about 25% of units that don't even go to camp, never mind Moses Scout Reservation, but any camp. So what we're going to do is we're going to uh, include them because the units that come to our camp, we want to find out what is it that we do from a program perspective that the, the scouts really love. For the units that go to outside camps, what is it that they do at the other camps that we can incorporate at Moses to have you come to our camp? And then what about the units that don't go anywhere? Why is that? You know, we offer provisional opportunities. There's, there's no reason a scout, one of our youths, shouldn't be and can't be coming to our camp. Statistically, it turned out that less than 40% of our units attended for uh, attended resident camp. And that was for Scouts BSA and, and Cub Scouts. Less than 40% went to our camp. They may have gone somewhere else. And then on the, on the, the PAC side, less than 20% attend day camp or resident camp at Moses, uh, you know, at for Western Mass Council. So there's lots of opportunity there that we're gonna go after. And finally here, it's, it's a call to action. You know, based on these studies, based on this reduction in membership, we're very concerned about summer camp in our council. We need all our units to attend Moses Scout Reservation in 2021. And that's gonna be our focus. Many units may have decided already where they're going to go. We need them to reconsider the fact that they're interested in going to another camp. I was a scoutmaster twice, uh, two runs. And yes, I hear many units say, well, you know, the PLC decided where we went. Well, in my troop, what I did is the decision was we were going to Moses Scout Reservation. And I let the youth, the, the PLC, decide what week. We need all units if, to go to camp and we need you to come to Moses Scout Reservation. So our plan is to, we have a team we're putting together and we're gonna be calling each of the units during the month of December and talk about the changes that are coming out of this team I referred to earlier as we readdress the, the, the program itself and perhaps looking at a new model for resident camping we're going to be, in, obviously, there'll be lots of communication on the website, mailings, postcards, etc. But we're going to make uh, phone calls to each unit during the month of December. It's a lot easy. It's easier to ignore a mailing or an email or social media. It's a lot harder to, if someone's talking to you over the phone and asking you pointed questions about your unit's decision to go to camp, it's a lot harder to duck the question. So we are, we are going to be aggressively pursuing all the units in our council to get them to come to Moses Scout Reservation in 2021. That's it, that's the end of my message. Hey, thank you, Bob. Um, I'm looking at the clock and we're, we're running, running a bit late. Joshua, do you have any additional information regarding rechartering and JTE that you wanted to put in? No, uh, I will just uh, echo what um, what Fritz said earlier pertaining to General Knox. It, it pertains to all three districts. Uh, so please, if you need help, if you, you know, at any point, reach out to your district commissioner, to your unit commissioner, to your council commissioner, reach out to somebody. Um, don't let it go because the last thing you wanna do is to wind up having to have to restart a brand new unit. So we're almost done, get it done. Thank you. Okay. 
Hey, thank you. Um, George, you were going to share some information with us about the Peace Light for our Hot Topics this evening. George, unmute yourself. Sorry about that. So we, yes, so we do have the peace light again this year. In the past years, we have brought it to Roundtable physically. Of course, this year we can't. So, but um, what, because of COVID, the actual, the light itself uh, did not arrive here in the U.S. because of restrictions in travel. However, and there are what we call peace light keepers, which Josh our Josh actually happens to be a keeper. Okay, go ahead. So um, yes, last week and I went and got the light from him. And so I currently have the flame here in Brimfield. So anybody on this side of Western Mass would like the peace light, you're welcome to reach out to myself via phone, uh, text or email. And um, we can meet somewhere as pass the light to you or to your church or so forth. Um, I've been using the light. The scouts at, at the First Congregational Church in Brimfield have been selling wreaths and trees. We have a campfire outside, so we use the peace light to light the fire. So you can come and grab the flame and take it home with you. Um, I can read a little bit about peace light, but we're short on time. So, um, but that's the story, the short of it. So, um, you know, basically the light, for those who don't know, the light actually comes from, it uh, started years back in, by Austrian Broadcasting Company. And it was basically a charitable relief mission called Light into Darkness and for children in need in Austria and abroad. It's, that's what it was basically what started it. And each year a child, they call the peace child from upper Austria kindles a flame from the eternal flame from the nativity grotto in Bethlehem. And from there they take the flame and it, it's flown to Austria and then distributed across Europe, and then wasn't two years ago, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, here in North America. And believe it or not, I, when I learned about it five years ago, it has got to be probably one of the best kept secrets in scouting because from day one, the flame makes it away Europe using scouts and, and other guides, scouts and guides, and same here in the U.S. I mean, it's here because of, of BSA. So, and there was a couple leaders that took it on, and and it's fascinating. If you go to Facebook, I think you'll find Peace Light North America, I think it is, and on Facebook page, and there's a website, and you can actually see the light has been making its way across the country again this year. So it's kind of cool to see all the scouts uh, involved, troops and churches and stuff, passing the light along. So there you go. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Greg, did you want to share any camping COVID-19 updates, any of those kinds of things as part of safety moments? Yeah, I'll try to keep it pretty quick, Ellie. I'll just, after last month's uh, round table, it was just days after the governor had come up with some, some new uh, regulations for it, <clears throat> living with it for a bit. But it, the national office has been saying all along, the three main questions, is it legal, is it safe, and is it practical? And the legal part has been the hardest part for us here in, in um, Western Massachusetts to determine. And so our local regulations uh, and approvals must be checked. And, and that's the part that's so hard for me. Every single community in West Massachusetts could have different uh, expectations. So uh, up at Moses, we had to look at the, the federal, the state, and then we had to work with the Russell Board of Health. So if you're looking to camp somewhere outside of Russell, um, I can't tell you if it's legal. Uh, you need to do that work yourself uh, with the local regulations and the boards of health um, because they supersede that. Uh, a, a, a local campground may or may not have approval um, to continue operating in that era. They may have a license or they may not have a license. So uh, it is really dependent upon the, the unit looking for a camping location to do that homework uh, to make sure that they are following all the regulations so that they are covered by insurance and operating uh, in an approved location at this point in time. Um, the face coverings uh, have changed. We, we need to be wearing them all the time when we're in public now, regardless of, uh, you know, if we're 
10 feet away from the next person. If there's other people around where we need to be wearing them. Um, one of the questions about the gathering orders is, you know, at your own residence, the numbers are a little different, 10 and 25 um, event venues and out in the public, uh, you can have 25 people indoors and then outdoors. It depends on the, the rating of the, the community at the time. And then Moses is different because Moses has a different license that it's operating under that is exempt from those gathering orders. That's that, that sector specific. They, we have, uh, are operating as a campground and we're operating as a youth serving uh, recreational program. Um, we're exempt from those numbers uh, for total but when we're camping, the uh, regulations require us to have cohorts of 12 or less. And if we're doing large events like a Camp Re or Woe, uh, the cohorts have to be 25 or less. Uh, we, we can choose to be smaller than that, but we can have, uh, it's over 400,000 people up at Moses by the state regulations. But then it goes back again to, is it safe and is it practical for us to do that? Uh, the curfew is the question I've gotten the most um, requests about um, and because the governor's asked us to be home during these hours and it, it applies to public areas it applies, you know at our residence so if, if I want to have my scouts camp at my my property um, there's a curfew that kicks in there's there I'm not supposed to have those folks there at 10 o'clock at night um, and then there's some specific industries that were named in that order specifically food and the entertainment right in the bars that are asked uh, to close at this point in time. Campgrounds are not included in that. And if you dig into the, that order, uh, the curfew, the stay at home advisory, and there's a whole section that talks about, you know, if you are a sector specific area that's exempt from this order. So uh, because we're operating under that sector specific uh, set of standards and we have permission from the Board of Health, camping up at Moses is currently available uh, no one has to go home at, at night as long as it's being operated by the unit or a scouting family. Um, and again, during those hours, people are in their tents uh, alone anyway and, and six or more feet apart. So other campgrounds, other locations, it really depends. And I wish I could give a, a more specific answer to those. I can help you try to determine the questions, um, but um, I can't, I, I won't be able to answer those for you. A little bit more information. I hope that helps. Ellie, thanks for the chance to share. Thank you so much. Uh, that's vital information. And I know our units have been asking about, you know, camping and can we, what can we and what can't we do? So uh, that that is huge information for us. At this point, we're ready to head into breakouts. Um, Looking at the time, 20 minutes will bring us to eight o'clock and our closing, and I'd like to keep to 20 minutes if we can. So, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. With Pinewood Derby coming up, we're going to uh, turn some candy into a Pinewood Derby car or a candy car. Okay, you will need, for, for this car, we will need seven Hershey's Nuggets, and four Rolos, and a glue gun. So I'm going to start with the Nuggets. We'll put a piece of glue there. Turn the second Nugget upside down, glue it together. The third Nugget right side up. And we'll do that again. One right side up to one that's upside down. Add one that's right side up. And now we're going to take and we are going to put the glue on the bottom of one and glue them together. Now to finish the chassis of the car, we're gonna put some glue on the center upside down one, and there's our little car. Let's add some wheels.
just on the bottom of the Rolo, put a little bit of glue and stick it on. Turn it around. And our little candy car is done. It's not going to move too far down on a Pinewood Derby track, but it was a cute, quick activity with a car for Pinewood Derby month. Done. Yes, hello and thanks, Matt. Um, so specifically, I'm going to talk about the Outdoor Ethics Program and the, some of how we, how, how we do outdoor ethics in uh, the Scouts BSA program. <clears throat> Sustainability is kind of even a bigger topic. And what I'm gonna do is try to go through this fairly quickly and then answer any questions. Um, Matt and George, do you have other things you need to cover during this, uh, during the breakout? Not that I'm aware of, it's all you. Okay, very good. So just give me a warning when things are getting close. I see the remaining clock ticking down there. Um, can everyone see my screen all right and hear me all right? Yep. Great, okay. So um, so again, uh, uh, my name's Dave O'Leary. I've lived here in Western Massachusetts for about three years now, um, but I've been a scout leader in various places for a while now. Uh, and um, one of my roles in uh, in scouting for the last several years was uh, chairing the national committee that uh, that focused on these outdoor ethics aspects of scouting. So I'm pretty familiar with this, but I, again, I'm just going to go through a quick presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions or at least try to answer any questions. So uh, I'm going to start out just talking about the mission statement of the BSA. And I hope that all of you have seen this at one point in time during your uh, uh, scout leader, one of your scout leader training sessions or wood badge or uh, ideally more than once. And so our mission is to prepare young people to make ethical and moral choices over their lifetimes by instilling in them the values of the scout oath and law. So ethical decision-making is uh, one of the key points of of this, of this mission, the thing that we are trying to accomplish as an organization. And of course, within the Boy Scouts of America, Cub Scouting, Scouts BSA, Venturing, Sea Scouting, we use outdoors as a method. And that is why the outdoor ethics, that's how outdoor ethics comes into this, where we are using that practical time in the outdoors when the uh, patrols and troops or in the Cub Scouts dens and, and packs uh, or venturing crews are outdoors and, uh, and participating in their activities, uh, learning to work as a team, they're practicing ethical decision-making. And, uh, and there are a variety of ways that that of course plays out in in, in, in our outdoor activities and the decisions, and we'll talk about the leave no trace principles and all that sort of thing. But the hope is that those things that the scouts practice and learn when they're working together as teams and participating in these outdoor activities are things that they take with them throughout their lives. It's not just pick up trash because it's a good thing to do. So there are four different elements of the outdoor ethics within the BSA, the outdoor code, the leave no trace principles, tread lightly in the land ethic. I'm gonna talk about each one of those individually. Uh, first, the outdoor code. And I hope that you're all familiar with this. Uh, the outdoor code has been around uh, since the early 1950s. So quite a long time in scouting. And again, I hope you're familiar with it, being clean in our outdoor manners, be careful with fire, be considerate in the outdoors and be conservation minded. And that really has guided uh, the responsible behavior of scouts and scout leaders in the outdoors. And while again, we usually think of these as dealing with nature, uh, they also um, 
deal with other people too. So be considerate of be considerate in the outdoors. And that can be considerate of other people, be considerate of the wildlife. But it's also about people. The outdoor code is in the Scouts BSA handbook. The pages are there. And uh, it has some more detail about how those uh, about the outdoor code and how it's applied in scouting. The leave no trace principles, again, I hope it's something you're, uh, you're familiar with. Um, and they kind of complement the outdoor code, whereas the outdoor code is kind of more aspirational and high level. The leave no trace principles provide us with the specific guidance on how do we do these different kinds of activities, um, whether it's hiking or camping, um, whether we're uh, car camping or whether we're backpacking, whether we're uh, canoeing, whether we're caving, there's a bunch of different uh, uh, guidance um, that's specific to these different activities. And the guidance is based on science. They've measured and determined, you know, what happens if we build fires that are too big or what happens if uh, and how can we, when we say respect wildlife, what are the proper ways to do that? How can we dispose of waste properly in a way that uh, if we're leaving something behind that it will decompose as quickly as possible, but how do we effectively take care of it and bring it out? And Leave No Trace has been around for uh, about 30 years now, almost 30 years from when it first started in the early 1990s. And BSA was very uh, closely in, engaged with that uh, process as, as, as the Leave No Trace principles were developed. And, and over the last 30 years, we've continued to implement uh, Leave No Trace throughout the Scouts, well, Boy Scout program and now Scouts BSA program. It's now part of the advancement and you probably have seen in many merit badge requirements. Uh, also for the venturing folks out there, the Venturing Ranger Award, it's one of the core elements. And a few years ago, we introduced the Outdoor Ethics Guide and it's really the outdoor ethics guide is that uh, the youth leader within the troop who has a responsibility to help the others learn about Leave No Trace and the outdoor code. So it's really uh, throughout the program. Just a few years ago, uh, the Cub Scout program, when the Cub Scout program was changed, uh, we also added a lot of Leave No Trace into the Cub Scout program. So hopefully the scouts who are coming through as we blows an arrow of light into your scout troops uh, will already have some familiarity with Leave No Trace when they, when they transfer over. Um, Tread Lightly is another uh, organization, another uh, external organization. I didn't mention that with regard to Leave No Trace. There, it's not just a, a scout thing, it's, it's a, a national program. So you'll see that and you probably have at state parks and national parks and in other, other places you've probably seen Leave No Trace. Uh, similarly, Tread Lightly is another uh, nonprofit organization external to BSA. The way we use Tread Lightly within scouting is specifically for motorized activities. That's ATVs, personal watercraft, and motorboats. And that's, those are uh, activities that are authorized to be done in council camps. If you've gone out to Moses in the summer, you've probably seen the ATVs there. Um, we don't have personal watercraft at Moses, and we, as far as I know, we don't have any motorboats at Moses either. But uh, but that's where Tread Lightly fits in. Uh, similarly, that there's seven principles for Leave No Trace. There are five principles for Tread, and uh, Tread is actually an acronym, the T R E A D. They each stand for one of the five principles, and those are just also described in the Scouts BSA handbook. Um, since this is not as comprehensive, it's only a couple pages in there, but that's a requirement for first class. Um, and then finally, the fourth part is the land ethic. And, uh, and this one is, is, I'd say a little fuzzier, you know, there's not a like seven principles for the land ethic or something like that, or, you know, the four parts of the outdoor code. But uh, if you saw that diagram with the umbrella that I put up in the, in the beginning, the land ethic was down at the bottom. And that's kind of the foundation is that we want to grow in our scouts an appreciation for the natural world, that they understand why it's important to protect the natural world and they feel uh, connected to the natural world. 
and they understand how uh, people are part of that uh, uh, community and the ecosystem. And um, the other parts there that I talked about, there's, an, there's a chapter in the uh, Scouts BSA handbook that talks about the outdoor code, leave no trace and tread lightly. Uh, and um, this page 185 is actually from the previous chapters. The, the first page where it talks about nature is the, uh, is the topic of that chapter. And so uh, hopefully this makes sense um, that uh, that's kind of one of the goals. You know, again, we're trying to um, encourage our uh, scouts to uh, develop that, that ethical behavior over a lifetime and the land ethic fits in. So they're also thinking about not just other people, but also the broader, the, you know, the, the earth that we live on and how it's important to protect it. So there are a bunch of resources out there that are available to you to learn about outdoor ethics. Um, on scouting.org in the outdoor programs section, there, uh, uh, there's information about the, this, all this stuff that I'm just talking about now. Um, there's information about leave no trace and how to practice it. Uh, as I'm sure you have probably realized if you've gone to scouting.org, it's not always the easiest to navigate the site and find things. But if you do type in the search, little search window on the upper right-hand corner, if you type in outdoor ethics or leave no trace, uh, the, you'll find, you'll get at least some answers that will, will get you uh, pretty close to where you want to be. Um, in addition, uh, so specifically on, on the site there that has information again about uh, just outdoor ethics in general and leave no trace and tread lightly, uh, there's also information about the Outdoor Ethics Award, which I'm not going to talk about in detail tonight, but if you have questions, happy to answer those. Um, there's also uh, a website that our committee actually put together, um, and this is really targeted for people who are teaching Leave No Trace. So there are a lot of resources there also uh, about the different training courses and things like that. Um, there's also contacts, uh, including my contact information. Um, uh, there's a calendar for the different courses that are being offered, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, there's also a couple of Facebook groups, uh, BSA Outdoor Ethics Facebook group. Uh, you're welcome to join. Um, it's not too high traffic, and fortunately, people are pretty well behaved there. And the Leave No Trace Center also has uh, Facebook uh, uh, sites where they post things. Uh, the Leave No Trace website, lnt.org, and the Tread Lightly website, uh, treadlightly.org, are also good resources for information. Um, uh, Leave No Trace also has some uh, uh, great uh, uh, YouTube videos about practicing Leave No Trace, and that's probably something you could do during one of your meetings. If your scouts are all gathered around their computers and watching by Zoom, you can uh, show some show some leave no trace videos and uh, there are also links to other um, other leave no trace videos on the BSA outdoor ethics or the outdoor ethics BSA website this the second one listed on this page so uh, quickly on training uh, there's a, kind of a series of different trainings that we have so first of all and this is the last bullet there um, if you've taken Baloo or Introduction to Outdoor Leadership Skills, Wood Badge or Powder Horn, they all have uh, components where we talk about outdoor ethics and leave no trace. Um, but there are also several uh, kind of dedicated courses and that are specific. So an outdoor ethics orientation is uh, a kind of a quick uh, one hour session that could be done at a troop meeting um, or if you're going on a, you know, a day hike and you want to take a break, you can do this uh, session. Um, so that's geared toward youth members and adults. Leave No Trace 101 is longer. Again, youth members and adults. It's uh, three to four hours. And that session, you dig into the Leave No Trace principles in more detail, including actually digging. One of the activities you do is digging a cat hole. And do some activities and games so it's pretty fun it's not just sitting listening to somebody lecture for for uh for four hours a leave no trace trainer course is typically offered on a weekend um 
Friday uh, evening through Sunday morning. Uh, that's open to adults and older youth. Um, just this last year, because of the pandemic, uh, we worked with the Leave No Trace Center. Uh, so the Leave No Trace trainer courses and the master educator courses are that's a, those are nationally offered courses by other by other organizations too. The first two are are BSA specific, but the Leave No Trace trainer course again is usually a weekend. But the Leave No Trace Center authorized during the pandemic for us to do kind of different versions of that because uh, it's so hard to uh, do camping. And of course, the, as Greg was just saying, it varies from place to place what the rules are. And of course, they keep changing. Um, and I've tried to, I actually, we had one on the schedule for April and some of you may have signed up. Uh, obviously that didn't happen. Sands. Uh, made that too difficult. I am going to try one more time uh, in the February, March time frame, and hopefully uh, we can find a date. I'm waiting to get things nailed down about Klondike derbies and all that stuff to not overlap, but hopefully we can find a date that will work. Uh, and the format would be uh, two or three evening Zoom sessions on weekdays or a Saturday, uh, kind of spread out. Uh, over a week or two, and then a Saturday uh, up at camp where we would not camp out and just spend a day and doing the rest of the course in person. So watch for news about that and let me know if you're interested. Uh, and I know I've heard from some of you already that you're interested and I have not forgotten about you. Uh, the Leave No Trace Master Educator course is, the, is a longer course and that's the course that uh, where you learn how to run Leave No Trace trainer courses and practice doing all this other training. And so uh, we offer, the BSA offers several of those around the country each year. Uh, this past year, again, a bunch got canceled because of the pandemic, but hopefully next year uh, we'll offer, uh, again, about uh, eight or 10 of them in different parts of the country. And information about those is posted on our that outdoorethics-bsa.org website that was on the last uh, page. Um, there are also Tread Lightly courses, a Tread Trainer and Tread Master courses. They are shorter um, and there's actually quite a bit of overlap with the Leave No Trace courses. We, we uh, encourage people to do the Leave No Trace courses, but um, only the Tread Lightly Center offers the Tread Trainer and Tread Master courses. So they're a lot harder to find and it's really not as relevant to, to uh, scout leaders. But um, the people who are um, running the tread or running the ATV program out at camp uh, uh, do those. So um, that's it for my presentation. I see I have about a minute and a half left. So happy to answer any questions if someone has one. It's going pretty fast, you know. I know at one point we were talking about um, having a another camporee that kind of focused around these topics. And I know camporees are kind of verboten at this moment, but I would love to see that happen because we did have one in the past. And I know a lot of my scouts were really having fun actually running some of the activities for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would be uh, happy to help uh, plan something like that. Uh, I know this May, hopefully we'll have the Moses 911 search and rescue. And I don't know, I don't see Steve Scannell here, but I know Steve had expressed interest in the um, doing another uh, conservation campery like we had a couple of years ago and certainly could be uh, incorporated there. And uh, I see the question, making the slides available. Yes, absolutely, I can do that. Um, we might even post them on that outdoorethics-bsa.org site. So 30 seconds left, any other questions? Feel free to uh, feel free to track me down anytime, um, and happy to help. And if it's helpful for you know to have somebody come and you know talk during one of your troop, that I would be glad to do it uh, via Zoom and eventually in person. I try not to make it too boring. Uh, Greg Stolzfus has our closing for this evening. Greg, we'll turn it over to you. Hey, thank you, Ellie. Wanted to do something a little lighthearted this evening for a closing. 
So as the holidays approach, I wanted to answer an important question that's on everybody's mind. Is Santa Claus a scout? To answer this question, I felt the best way to do it was to examine Santa and see how he stacks up against the scout law. First of all, is he trustworthy? Well, we can certainly trust that Santa will show up every year. Is he loyal? He's very dedicated to his mission. And imagine the disappointment if he wasn't loyal to his work. Is he helpful? He saves many a parent from last minute shopping. Is he friendly? He lets about a zillion kids sit on his lap and tell them what it, they want, all while keeping a smile on his face. Is he courteous? He always says thank you for the milk and cookies. Is he kind? Delivering gifts to children is a great act of kindness. Is he obedient? This one was a bit tricky, so I emailed Mrs. Claus. I didn't get a response back from her, but seeing he's been married for all those years, I'll say that he does what she tells him to do. <laughs> is he cheerful? Ho, ho, ho. That's all I need to say. Is he thrifty? Well, he makes all his own toys. That sends a, saves a bundle on shipping. Is he brave? Well, would you get into a sleigh pulled by magic reindeer and fly across the sky? I know I wouldn't. Is he clean? I don't know how he does it, but that red suit looks great even after millions and millions of chimneys. Is he reverent? Santa does his thing on a special night as part of a religious holiday. So is Santa Claus a scouter? I would say definitely. This time of year, no matter what holiday you celebrate, remember that doing your best and living the scout oath and law are what makes each of us a scouter. Back to you, Ellie. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. That, that was a really great closing. Uh, thank you, everyone. In January, right now, our calendar has us looking at, uh, at the Cub Scout breakout, the Arrow of Light transition to Scouts BSA, and the uh, Scouts BSA and crew group is right now uh, scheduled to be looking at Scout Book 101. So share the information with other people. That's what we're planning right now. And um, if that changes, we will be definitely be putting it in the, in the council newsletter. So in the meantime, between now and January 4th, please have a, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a, a very wonderful holiday season. Good night, all.